let's, go, let's, let's, let's preach a little something that you may have never heard me uh, come up with. It's a little bit, I would say, heavy. In some ways, I was telling Pastor Mike about I, I love America. I travel this nation. I appreciate this nation. But there are things going on in our nation that I struggle with. So as I'm walking through the Word of God, my message this morning is our response in a pessimistic time. Our man, uh, what was it, Stephen Sexton talked about our response. And it connected with me. It resonated inside me, how we respond to things. And pessimism, of course, is negativity. It's always being negative, not, not see. It's a glass half empty instead of half full. And by nature, I'm not eternally optimistic. I'm a realist. I'm a very, you know, when I see things, to me, that's real. But on the flip side, uh, in, in my life, I believe that God made me, oh, yeah, gave me the ability to be optimistic. I remember when I discovered my blood type was B positive. <laughs> I knew then that God really wanted me to be a little more optimistic. Can I get an amen? Optimism is hopefulness and confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. Let's say it again. It's hopefulness and confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. Optimism is a feeling or belief that good things will happen in the future. A feeling or belief that what you hope for will happen. I've heard this preached so many times. Your best days are ahead. Have you ever heard that? People prophesy, preachers come in. Your best days are ahead. After a little while, I'm going to tell you something. They ain't. Hey Amen. You heading downhill, you feel downhill, you get up feeling rough, you know, and you want to have your best days. I understand that. I can say that if you're 30, 40, 50 year old, maybe 60, but there comes a time when you realize I just got to make tomorrow the better day. Amen. If tomorrow's better than today, I'm going to receive that in the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. So sometimes that doesn't play out. It sounds good. Preach is good. Amen. It's, it's, it's optimistic. I understand that. But again, optimism is a feeling or belief that good things will happen in the future, a feeling or belief that what you hope for will happen, an inclination to put the most favorable construction upon actions and events or to anticipate the best possible outcome. But first, let me speak to you a little bit about darkness. I read this this week. It was a quote from a, a leader of a, a country over in the East, and he spoke about the Western morals. Speaking of our nation and our morals and what has happened. He said, now they have moved on entirely to a radical denial of moral norms, religion, and family. The dignity, and again, hear me out, and then I'll, I'll preface this a little bit. The dictatorship of the Western elites, speaking of America, is directed against all societies, including the peoples of the Western countries themselves, even inside our nation. This is a challenge to all. This is a complete denial of humanity, the overthrow of faith and traditional values. Indeed, the suppression of freedom itself has taken on the features of a religion. Outright Satanism. Do we really want here in our country, in Russia, instead of mom and dad, to have parent number one, parent number two, parent number three, have they gone completely insane? Do we really want it drilled into our children in our schools that there are supposedly genders besides women and men and children to be offered the chance to undergo sex change operations? We have a different future, our own future. Vladimir Putin. And I read that and I thought to myself, he's not wrong. But what he's doing, he's using our evil against us. And he's coming up for a reason to go against Ukraine and other nations. Now, if you think to yourself, and this is very important, you've got to have a biblical mindset here. You've got to have a global mindset here. You've got to understand that America is not the only nation in the world. But I love America. So I stand and say, God, what is my response to the pessimism in this world when I see other countries taking shots at us for the wickedness that's going on in our nation. Yeah, I want to tell you, a messed up nation needs a fired up church. Can I get an amen? amen? 
Amen. I mean, and for people that love people, but also stand for truth. Our culture has changed so fast over the last 25 years. It's amazing that the church world, we just kind of gone on with, you know, the same old, same old. But the bottom line is we have to be able to stand and say, God, save America. Amen. I, you're, my, you're my only hope. You're the only one that I need. When God judged Israel, his people, when he judged them for their disobedience and wickedness, he always used other countries to punish them. He used Egypt for 400 years. He used all the ites, the Canaanites, the Amorites, all the ites. He used them to punish Israel when they wouldn't do the right thing. He used Babylon, and we're going to hit Babylon here today. He used Babylon in order to deal with them. Amen. And, and as a believer, we can't deny the shifting culture of violence, disobedience, and wickedness in our nation being promoted by the elected leaders to please a minority of people. So how should we respond as a remnant of God-loving people? Use the word, everybody say remnant. It's that little piece of cloth that's left over. When God looks at us, he sees a remnant. In other words, we're never going to be, hear me, the majority. We'll always be that remnant of people that love God through life. And here we find that, and I have to ask the question, is my America becoming Babylon? Are we becoming that with that kind of wickedness? And I know this is not a message you used to hear me say, but let me just tell you real quickly about Babylon. When you study that word, it has a, sy a symbolic meaning of the world system under satanic domination. More specifically, it seems that in every era of world history, the spirit of Babylon settles down under Satan's dark wisdom to refer to whatever realm is dominating. In other words, that word is not just a place, but it's a spirit that moves into a nation. And as you walk through it, you realize that, uh, let me find where I'm at, is dominating the earth militarily and or economically. So the prediction of the fall of Babylon in Isaiah 47 is ultimately timeless, relevant to every generation of human history. What God will do to a nation like Babylon, Isaiah chapter 47, verse 4, our Redeemer, the Lord Almighty is His name, is the Holy One of Israel. Sit in silence, go into darkness, queen city of the Babylonians. No more will you be called queen of kingdoms. I was angry with my people and desecrated my, who desecrated my inheritance. I gave them into your hand, and you showed them no mercy. Even on the aged, you laid a very heavy yoke. You said, I am forever the eternal queen, but you did not consider these things or reflect on what might happen. Now then, listen, you lover of pleasure, lounging in your security, and saying to yourself, I am, there is none besides me. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Both of these will overtake you in a moment. On a single day, the loss of children, widowhood, they will come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. You have trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead you when you say to yourself, I am and there is none beside me. Disaster will come upon you. You will not, uh, you will not know how to con conjure it away. A calamity will fall upon you that you cannot ward off with a ransom. A catastrophe you cannot foresee will suddenly come upon you. When I read this, I read the destruction of Babylon. I also read that it can still happen in the future. That if a nation rises up, becomes wicked, God can bring it down. He'll let them run on for a little while. He'll even use them to punish other nations. But then he'll say, you know what? En enough. In one day, I'll take you out. And now I am not promoting uh, what's going on in Russia, by the way. Their politics, uh, that man Putin is a wicked man. Amen. He's immoral. He's a murderer. Amen. And everything he's pointed us about, you know, they, don't, they may not be having it as bad because of their stand. But the bottom line is he looks at us and our looseness and he says, we don't want that over here in Russia. So we got this fight going on. And again, until you're Russian or until you're over there in the east, you really don't understand this whole thing is going on right now anyway. Amen. So as I'm walking through it, speaking of Babylon, how did one man respond when he was kidnapped and brought into Babylon? His name was Daniel. What was his response like? What if we are in Babylon? How are you going to react to all the nonsense that's going on from California to New York? All the craziness that's going on in our... When I heard you could no longer or should not call your mama, mama, and your dad, here's my problem. I was raised, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. I looked at a woman the other day at a store, and I said, yes, ma'am. Her, her name on her jacket said Jack. But I couldn't help myself. When I see woman, I think ma'am. When I see man, I think sir. 
When I see idiots, I think idiot. Are you following the preacher right now? Amen. So uh, it's just who I am. It's, my, it's how I was raised. It's my culture. Amen. To be polite to people. I'm not here to try to guess what you think your gender might be this week. Right. Amen. I'm here to tell you that this is what I, I'm not. It's not about hurting your feelings. The issue here is that God don't change. Amen. We're trying to change God to fit who we are. God ain't going to change. Amen. So we have to learn how to figure this thing out for ourselves. So we find that Daniel gets kidnapped. He gets brought into Babylon. There's a good opportunity when you understand the, 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 uh, the slavery, the removing of, of the, uh, uh, the Israelites to, to come and to work for another country like he did, that his parents were murdered. And they took him in as a young man. And the scripture says in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, speaking of his character, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Now, that's, I think this would be King Darius. We're going to walk through several kings here. I'm going to move very quickly. But I, I just want to pick up on the nature of Daniel, how Daniel dealt with things. In a place that was like Babylon, a place that was full of wickedness and immorality and, and where people were doing their own thing, Daniel had an excellent Excellent. Everybody say excellent. An excellent spirit. When you get your spirit right, this, this thing inside of you, the, that's what we are. We are body, soul, spirit. When you get your attitude, your spirit right, it will produce a quality in your character that will enable you to achieve excellence in every area of your life. Youngie Cho is a pastor. I don't know if he's still the pastor there in South Korea, but he pastored 750,000 people. That's, a, that's crazy. I mean, he filled stadiums, and, and uh, he, he had a lot of home meetings in order to make this happen. But he had a rule for his congregation that you are forbidden to speak of Jesus till you've done at least three good deeds. Don't talk about Jesus till you first show you an example towards somebody. It opened the hearts for the gospel. I was at a little restaurant, had J.J. with us, and she disappeared for a moment. And then she came back and sat down and started eating her pizza. Then, then about 30 minutes later, a fireman walked around the corner, looked at her, and he said, thank you. And I looked at David. I said, what was that about? He said, well, J.J. went over and thanked him for being a fireman. I said, all right now. Amen. Those kind of good deeds. We serve an excellent God. Psalm chapter 8, verse 1. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, the whole earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Sing, Isaiah says, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. The more you watch a National Geographic, the more excellent you notice God is. Amen. Whether it be the fish in the sea or the birds in the air, this is one of my favorite times of the year. We got Thanksgiving. We got Christmas, and it's hunting season. Amen. Amen. How excellent is your name in all the earth. I, I love the fact that God set things up for us. He's an excellent God. Amen. Everything he does is excellent. This also comes forth. He, Isaiah said 28, uh, chapter 28, forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel. Excellent in working. I've often said, I can give you advice, but I'm not going to give you counsel. Amen. I can't counsel you. I want God to counsel you. That's why I think you need to come and sit at church or pray around the church or be on the property somewhere and ask God, God, counsel me. Amen. Through your word, give me counsel. I can give advice. I went and played golf again, uh, 18 holes. First time in 20 years I've played 18 holes. And I was with the men I was with, and I said to them, I gave them advice the whole day. I used to play. I can give you advice, but I can't hit it like I used to. <laughs> Matter of fact, I can do very little like I used to, but I was good at giving advice. Hey, Amen. How many know what I'm talking about out there? Hey, Amen. That, that was good stuff. So being excellent doesn't mean being perfect. Thank you, Lord. Doesn't mean that. Webster Dictionary says a thing is excellent when it is distinguished by what it is. Excellent in the business world. The result of believing that all jobs and projects should be performed in a superior way. God says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mind. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. When I read that, I, I, I got to sit back and say, now, I believe the Word of God is true. And if this, is, if this word is what I'm thinking it is, it means you better get all the wisdom you can while you're here. Get all the knowledge you can while you're here. You better figure some stuff out. right, Because you may not be learning as much as you think you're going to when you get to heaven. Wouldn't it be bad if you got to heaven as dumb as you are now? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those watching right now online. Amen. I want to be a little brighter, a little smarter. Can I get an Amen. 
Amen. We're all serving in the king's house. I believe our work should be excellent. Our church, our praise, our music, singing, whatever we're doing. An excellent spirit, again, produces excellent thoughts. Excellent thoughts produce excellent behavior. You act right because you're thinking right. Excellent behavior produces excellent achievement. I've said this for years. Your belief uh, uh, affects your behavior, how you believe. So if you work in the area of excellence. So here's a man who's been removed from his family. And he's in Babylon, and he's serving with the king. But the Bible says to him he had an excellent spirit. So I'm telling God today, I said, Lord, I don't want to get bitter about what's going on in America. And if America is becoming a Babylon, if America is becoming wicked, okay, I, I may not be able to change all that. But I know who I can change. I can change me. And I can work on my attitude. So don't let what you cannot change change you. Amen. If I can't change, if I can't change that, why, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote for righteousness. I'm going to vote for the unborn. I'm, I'm going to vote for right things. Amen. But as I vote, I'm going to know this. If people cancel out my vote, if things happen and, and it, I don't get what I want, amen, I wake up the next morning and I find out somehow in the nighttime <laughs> somebody got more votes in a basement than anyone else, then I'm going to say, dear God, I, I'm stuck where I'm at. Help me to have an excellent spirit. Can I get an Amen. I just want to have an excellent spirit. So Daniel knew he couldn't change the situation, but he was so optimistic. Woo! You can't be optimistic if you got a mystic optic. Amen. If, you're, if your sight is, you know, I just started wearing glasses. I had a revelation the other day. I gave a friend of mine, uh, Pastor David Hilton, a shotgun. We had that men's day out there, Ken, that beast feast. And I went out to shoot skeet. I couldn't hit nothing. Man, I mean, I was missing skeet left, right, left, right. I thought, what's wrong with this gun? Because I always shoot skeet. I always do well shooting skeet. And David Hilton grabbed my gun. He shot. He's a good friend of mine. And he, said, he hit all five. Bang, 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 bang. And I said, you go ahead and keep that gun. I said, you go ahead and keep that gun. That gun didn't do me any good. I couldn't hit nothing. And then a month or two later, it dawned on me, I can't see. <laughs> and then I got these glasses. And I thought to myself, Seth, you gave that gun away a little too early. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, you messed up. Especially when he started sending me pictures of all the dove he's already killed with my gun. I thought, I, that's my gun. <laughs> Amen. He boasting about my gun. But if I'd had these glasses, I, I, I could have hit them skis. I know I could have. Amen. How I many you know sometimes we move a little too quick? It still blessed him. So again, don't let what you cannot change, change you. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. What are you going to do if things get bad? I'm going to keep praising. I ain't going to quit praising. I'm going to, I, well, what if it gets really bad? I'm going to keep praising. Amen. And he said, praise me to the Lord, the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and, lie in, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God, of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we have asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Now, this is when uh, uh, Darius had a king, had a dream. He had a dream. And nobody else could answer it. And he called all of his uh, diviners in and all of his witchcraft people in. And none of them could answer it. Matter of fact, he said, I'm going to kill every one of y'all. You can't answer my dream. King Darius of Babylon said, you can't answer my dream. I'll kill y'all. And somebody said, hold on. We know a Christian. <laughs> we know a man of God. We know somebody that might can answer that. We don't want to die. In other words, we're still wicked, but we don't want to die. So they called Daniel in. And I love what Daniel said. God sets up kings and tears them down. God puts in presidents and tears them down. God lifts up a nation and destroys it. So when I read that, I think of the word providence again. That God, I can't change everything that's going on in that White House. Amen. I can't change the nature of governments. I'm going to do my best as a citizen of this great nation to vote. And to make my opinion known when needed and watch myself on some things. But I, I know you're excellent. And I know when things can't change, I can't let it change me. Amen. I'm not going to fall into that trap. Hallelujah. Like Daniel said. So Daniel said, no, no, no don't you worry. I, 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 God reveals stuff. So he, I love Daniel. You know what he could have said? Go ahead and kill all them wicked people and get them out of the way. Make room for me. But he didn't. Now I'm going to tell you something. That little uh, incident... Almost backfired on him. 
Because these very same people came back and tried to take advantage of him in his prayer life. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Amen. Uh, where am I at here? Uh, so Daniel, before the king, now he's before King Nebuchadnezzar. It was King Nebuchadnezzar that dreamed the dream of the, of the statue. Amen. He answers the dream. And a lot of people have dissected this statue and looked at it because Daniel uh, has a reflection in the book of Revelation. Amen. I'm not going there today, but the statue was made out of, of bronze and gold and clay and things. So here's a man who's standing before a king, and he gives him a square answer. And he says to him, Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there's a God. <laughs> He's not an idol. There's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Then Daniel interpreted a dream of coming kingdoms that would rule, but one would come that would keep dominion. As a matter of fact, he said, your kingdom is coming to an end. Your kingdom is going to be gone. And, and the king rewarded him for it because he interpreted the dream. But then Daniel goes on to say something every believer needs to grab hold of. Verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. There's coming a day when King Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he'll set up his kingdom. And no other kingdom will rule over that. Can I get an amen? This is our hope. This is what we hang on to. So optimistic people have care for other people. Pessimistic people don't care about nobody but themselves. They're negative. They always talk about how bad things are. But when you're optimistic, amen, you, you begin to care. Daniel wasn't interested in programs. Hear me. Policies. He wasn't interested in the politics. This is where we got to be careful. He wasn't interested in that. Amen. But, but here, or success, he cared about people. And if we allow what's going on in our nation to cause us to stop caring about people, we've messed up. We've missed it. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and would have killed all the men of Babylon if they couldn't interpret it. Daniel stepped up with, as a matter of fact, verse 14 said, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Learn how to deal with people of power with wisdom and tact. People that have, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, authority. Learn how to deal with them with wisdom and tact. Don't just be a smart aleck. Amen. Learn how to talk to him properly. Thereby, he saved three other guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. Because they were with him. Daniel chapter 2, verse 47 says, The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished him with many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shagrat, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. In other words, optimism is a promoter to those that are connected to you. When you're optimistic, you want to bring somebody else with you. Amen. I, I don't freak out, man. I'm telling you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three guys are great guys. When you get promoted, bring somebody up with you. Amen. When God blesses you, bless somebody else up with you. Amen. He was lavish with gifts. He had tremendous power and wealth at that moment. He wasn't after it, but God promoted him. It's called what I would call the power of transference. It's not what you know, but it's who you know. Then it's what you know. See, I know a lot of people that know a lot of what, but they don't know a lot of who. You need to know a lot of who before you get your what can help you. Can I get an amen? Amen. So learn a whole lot, but learn how to be connected. Don't be mad and say, well, they just promote people because that's who they know. Of course they did. Yeah, well, you get mad about that all day long. My dad worked for TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority in uh, North Alabama. You know how he got that job? Because he knew somebody. There's this little good buddy club around here called Exxon. <laughs> you know who gets on there? People that know somebody. And then you'll watch important. You can get mad about it, kick against the, the goads, get to say it's wrong, or you can just suck it up and learn and get to know some people. Can I get an amen? Amen. Connect that way. So the power of transference is powerful. Daniel 2.20, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Though I, and again, I mentioned to you he was kidnapped, but I didn't tell you they removed his reproductive organs. So Daniel was a eunuch. 
You want to talk about being bitter? Not only am I, my, they killed my parents, kidnapped me, but they removed my ability to have children. I'd even have a desire to get married. And they did that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also. But I'm going to tell you something. How excellent is thy name in all the earth? He kept an excellent spirit. He stayed optimistic. Amen. And, and when I read about Daniel, he made the, these statements come to my mind. Amen. He who honors God, him he will honor. God honored Daniel and delivered him from the lion and the lions. God honored Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, delivered them from the flame. Do you remember before Shadrach, Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow to the golden uh, statue? Amen. Wasn't going to do it. And because of that, they were thrown into the fire. But before they threw them in the fire, they made a confession. And they said this, they're in Babylon. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That, that one passage goes against a lot of the theology I'm hearing in American Christendom. When, when you make a statement, he is able. God is able. Well, that's powerful, man. You remember we talked about the, the power of life is in the tongue. Amen. Death and life is in the tongue. That's powerful. But he's able to save us. But when you say the word but, it's almost like, well, hold on. You're being a little negative now. You're acting like God can't do it. Now, you ain't listening to me. First off, I know he's able. He can do it. Second, let me tell you, I submit to him. Even if he doesn't, I ain't bowing. Amen. In other words, I might live, I might die. Either way, I ain't bowing. They had no, uh, no uh, assurance that when they were thrown into the fire that they would not die at that moment. But the scripture says when they were thrown in the fire, bound hand and foot, and they thrown in, it was so hot that the men that threw them in caught on fire. So it burned the very men who had already bowed. So they're burned up. They throw them in. Amen. And they in the fire. And then when they look into the fire, they see four men walking around the fire. And the Bible says one looks like the Son of God. It's an amazing story. And when they come out of the fire, I mean, you can't even fathom that. If you've ever got your hand near a flame, you understand what I'm saying. Amen. He's, I know some of you want to practice a little Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just, 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 just try. He said, Lord Jesus, don't, don't let it burn me. Ah, oh, don't tempt him. Amen. I, I filled the bathtub up and tried to walk on water. All I did was take a bath. <laughs> don't tempt him. Can I get amen? Amen. Amen. I know we all try these Bible things. You know, we work on it. And they, but when it's necessary, I believe God can do it. Can I get an amen? He said he's able. That's obedience. But if he does it, that's submission to his will. God, I, I don't like wearing these glasses. But if I got to wear them the rest of my life, I will. I don't like limping. But if I limp the rest of my life, I, I, I will. You know, I'm going to submit to you. I know you are able. I know you're able to heal. I know you're able to deliver. I know you're able to bless. Amen. But if I don't see it, he, as Paul prayed three times for a thorn to be taken away from him, you hear the words of the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. If God healed us every time we prayed, we'd be arrogant. Amen. We'd live too long. Let me close. Another response to Daniel, prayer. Prayer. Mm. A decree went out. For no one to pray or petition for 30 days except to King Darius. When they wrote that, King Darius didn't know that Daniel had agreed. They, those people went to him and actually said they called satraps. They, uh, they were setting a trap. And they went to the King Darius and they said, King, let me tell you something. We, we believe you are. We, it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> how, how do you say that? Uh, uh, King Appreciation Month. It's King Appreciation Month. 30 days. King Appreciation Month. We're going to appreciate you, King. We're going to show you how much we appreciate you. Nobody's going to pray to anybody except to you. Nobody's going to. Everybody's going to come to church for 30 days. It's King Appreciation Month. And we're going to appreciate you, King Darius. Oh, man, we're so excited. And everybody signed that. Who didn't sign it? Daniel. Daniel wouldn't sign something like that. That would cause him not to talk to his God. So Daniel didn't sign it, but they lied. These guys are always lying. This is what got Daniel in the, in the, in the lion's den. I call them liars in the den because that's what they were. 
So they tell, they tell the king that. So the king says, sure, that sounds good. King Appreciation Month. I like that. Maybe we feel good, appreciate it. And so here they go, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now Daniel learned, he heard, that it was King Appreciation Month. So he went upstairs to a room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. He had a habit of praying. He opened his window, prayed. I know he could have went secret. He could have been quiet. He could have done that, you know, that uh, school prayer. Just bow your head. Don't say that. Amen. Go to Eden. But he stood toward the window. Lord God of heaven, great deliverer, I'm stuck in this wicked, foul, nasty land. The king is about as dumb a king as I've ever seen. He borders on stupidity. I think he's a little bit inbred. But God, I love you. And I ask you to promote my friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There with their cell phones recording everything Daniel is saying. Three times a day, they know when he's there. And there he goes up to the window, throws the window open, and begins to pray again. God, all them suck-ups, he stuck around the king. They worthless. They fuel for hell. God, help them to turn toward you before it's too late. Did you get that on the phone? I got it on the phone right here. I got it right here on the phone. Then they rush over to the king. And see, look what that man done did. He keeps praying. He ain't shut up. Darius, you said that if he keeps doing that, he got to go into the lion's den. And he did. They put him in the den. See, I can't always tell you what prayer does. It doesn't do. But I can tell you what it do. It can divide a Red Sea. It can make water gush from a rock in a wilderness. Prayer can quench the flames of a fiery furnace. Prayer can shut the mouths of a lions in the den. Prayer conquers devils and dispatches angels. Prayer. The disciples never said, Lord, teach us to dance. The disciples never said, Lord, teach us to sing. The disciples never said, Lord, teach us to preach. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. We don't know how to pray. We heard it some this week. When the disciples' prayer, never thought it was the Lord's prayer. He was teaching them how to pray. Luke 11, when you pray, say, Our Father. He's our Father. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. The power of prayer, you see, you can't pray and stay mad. Can't do it. You can't pray and talk about your pastor or fellow church member. You can't pray and stay grouchy or have a negative or defeatist attitude. You can't be pessimistic about other people's optimistic. Amen. You should be upset with him. We've got to stay optimistic. What is the word again? A feeling or belief that good things will happen in the future. God, if God had never stuck Daniel in Babylon, we'd have never had the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We'd have never known that three men could stand against all of those and be thrown into a furnace. We'd have never known that a man could be put into a den of lions that were so hungry that after they lifted Daniel out, and threw those men who accused him into it, before their feet hit the ground, the lions devoured them. That's how hungry they were. We'd have never had those stories. Imagine the stories that are going to come out of this nation if it turns even more wicked. And God help us that we don't become Babylon. But if what other nations are saying about our nation, when they look over here and see our foolishness, and all the craziness that's coming down the pike. And they say, my God, 
What's happened to America? That nation that used to send out missionaries. That nation that had such powerful uh, um, ability to be benevolent toward other nations. What happened to that nation that is now owned basically by China and other countries that are buying out all of their land around? What happened to that nation? God help us to stand and have an excellent spirit. Stay optimistic. Keep prayer life. Can I get an amen? I use this verse quite often. We'll say it again, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. When you find the purpose of God in your life, goodness is going to follow you. But you've got to find the purpose. Would you stand with me? I'm going to close with something. Some scripture out of the book of Thessalonians. I want you to listen real good now. Because you might be mad at me because I spoke about your nation. It's my nation too. I love Texas, the nation of Texas, and the rest of the country. Amen? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Listen to this. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. In other words, don't get shaken by what you heard preached today. Don't be bothered. You say, well, Pastor said America's becoming. I just asked the question. Are we becoming like this nation I'm reading about, this spirit that I'm reading about? That spirit's even in the book of Revelation talks about it. The spirit of Babylon. Are we becoming like that? Don't be shaken. Don't let that shake you up, man. Keep reading, preacher. Okay. Verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. Oh. I was with a man the other day, and he spoke harshness about our nation. He went on and on about how bad it's becoming. This, this, I'm easy on y'all today. I mean, he went after it. When he got done... They asked my opinion. My opinion was this. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of Son of Man. It's only going to get darker. And the darker it gets, the more light you're going to see. Right now, everything seems a little gray. But pretty soon, you're going to see a dividing line between darkness and light. Amen. So I, I don't look at it as a bad thing. I see it hastening the day of the Lord. So he said, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness, speaking of the Antichrist, is revealed the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object or worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know that you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time? Next verse. For the mystery of lawlessness, David, come here. Turn toward, turn toward me, sis. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, he will do so until he is out of the way. The restrainer. I want, I want you to act like you're going to get toward Lucinda. I'm restraining him. Right now, Christ is restraining the spirit of Babylon. The world, Satan himself, he is the great restrainer. Amen. And he's stopping it from getting to the bride. But one day, the restrainer is going to be gone. <laughs> now watch this. If I understand my scripture right, and I, I, don't, I don't know enough about eschatology. Everybody writes books on it and they try to figure it out. But there's a great chance here, come here, David, that the restrainer is here. If the bride of Christ is there, get out of here. And God takes the bride home. And then he steps out of the way. And when the restrainer is no longer restraining, and if the church, if I'm reading this right, is gone, the world will become evil that fast. The salt of the earth will be taken away. And if you know anything about salt, salt preserves. You are preserving this world.
from rotting and getting worse. And when God takes you out of here, somebody may not like you, but you just might look at them and say, I'm salt. I'm here to irritate you. Can I get an amen? amen? You get salt in a wound, it irritates. We're not here to be nice. We're here to bother folk. Oh, you can be nice about it, but you can still bother them. But salt preserves. And when we're gone, the world will rot. That's why the church is so important. Heads bowed, eyes closed just for a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, take this message wherever we're at in it. Help us understand to have an excellent spirit, to be optimistic, to have a prayer life. Not to be asked to be taken out of here. You're restraining this world from becoming so wicked it overcomes us. We need to see a fired up church in a messed up world. Help us to have the right response. Oh, and everybody said amen if you believe that. Come on, give God a big amen in here. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. The great restrainer. If it hadn't been for Jesus, we'd have done been overcome. Amen. He's restraining. Be seated just for a brief moment. Our servant leaders to come up. And in front of you is a tithe and offer an envelope. Amen. I noticed that our income has dipped some. I'm not concerned. I believe it's already there. Yeah, a lot of folk been on vacation, so you got a lot of money to give, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> your tithe never goes on vacation. Amen. If you have your envelope there, if you give it on your phone, just kind of wave it when the guys go by there. I want to proclaim this with you. Before I do, let me mention this. Uh, I believe that our churches should be strong enough to have two trunk or treats where we can do that here and we can do it out there. There's a, 650 families on Baptist Encampment Road, and we've only reached a few of them. I'd like to reach more. So I want to have something out there. We haven't done it out there in many years. But I also believe right here on this freeway is a great opportunity to reach people. So I, I'm going to ask you to think about that this week. And if you say, Pastor, I, I'm willing to come over, open my trunk, throw some goodies in there. You don't have to dress up like a ghoul or a witch or, or Frankenstein. Hey, man, you can come as a Bible character. You know what I'm saying? You, you don't even have to do any of that. You can just open your trunk and say, hey, you want some candy? Get some candy. I'm trying to keep you away from the real nasty people out there. There's some nasty people out there. Hey, man, I'd rather you come right here and get your candy. Because kids are going to do it. So if you say, Pastor, I'm, that's something that I, I think I can come and open my trunk and, and do that for somebody on that Monday of, for two hours from 6 to 8 o'clock here in this property. We've done it here for a couple of years now. If you say that, you could do that. Would you lift your hand? Because I just need to know if I could have enough people here that can do that. Amen. I'm going to ask you again next Sunday, and then I'm going to find a leader to help promote this, because, you know, I'm going to be out yonder to other places and ask them the same thing. Amen. But it's just simply for two hours to invite people to come out, be a witness, smile, and, uh, and be able to uh, connect. And then we move toward thanks. I love Thanksgiving. <laughs> Giblet gravy. Cranberry sauce, turkey, pumpkin pie. Ooh, Miss Linda. Mm hmm. Yeah, just throwing it out there, that's all. <laughs> As we give today, we believe in God for it. Jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money. Bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. Pastor David, if you'd come up and close us in prayer, I think it's just a couple of announcements that still need to be made. Amen. All right. All right. Give it up for your pastor here. <laughs>